probably get going. Just give me one second to pull everything together. I am so excited to have you all here with us tonight, and I'm very excited to introduce um, our first of four uh, quarterly diversity health series tonight. Tonight's topic is COVID-19 disparities and Northern Nevada's response. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Dr. Nicole Jacobs. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. I'm also a clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, we are recording this and we will be uploading the link to the recording for anyone that wants to watch this again. Um, it should be on the Office for Diversity and Inclusion website through UNR Med. Um, so the diversity Diversity Health Series is offered quarterly, as I mentioned. Um, at the end, I will let you know about the other three events that are going to be happening this year, and we hope that you join us for those. The goals of the Diversity Health Series are um, to really offer training and to try to enhance the cultural sensitivity and competence and the humility of the healthcare workforce. We also hope to promote diversity, equity, and um, enhance the culture of inclusivity and reach out to the larger community around the shared value that we all have for health equity. So I'm especially happy to have such a wonderful audience of folks here tonight that all care about the same thing. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to just also recognize that we have a lot of um, staff and healthcare providers from other hospitals, other clinical institutions, um, private practices. Um, we cherish our partnerships with you and we are so glad that you are here tonight. Um, I do also want to say that several other hospitals and clinics did want to be part of this panel, but we try to, to, to keep it, um, you know, not, not let it get unruly and out of hand. We already have seven panelists, but we do hope that this is the first of many such events where folks who have this shared value around health equity can come together and we can continue to work together. Um, I also would like to uh, thank Dr. Jennifer Doherty um, from my office before we be begin. She is the program manager for retention and equity. She is uh, my partner in everything that I do through this office and she has worked tirelessly um, to put together this event to get out the advertisements. And so I really wanna thank you, Dr. Doherty, for your help there. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes and then I'll go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, we do ask that you keep your microphones muted unless you are uh, a speaker. Um, if you would like to focus on the person who is speaking, you can use the speaker view in order to do so. Um, if you have any questions or comments throughout the panel, we aim to speak for about an hour and try to reserve the last half hour for a Q&A portion. So please reserve your questions, but you're welcome to type them into the chat box um, as you think of them, and we will try to address the questions in the last half hour. If you are here and you need CMEs, continuing medical education credits, please uh, reach out to Dr. Jennifer Doherty for the form, and we just ask that you have that filled out and signed back to us within uh, a week. If you are a practice of medicine student, we're so glad you're here. There's no need to sign in. Just make sure that you do your reflection and have that uploaded to Canvas by next uh, Friday at 5 p.m. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our um, wonderful uh, panel of speakers here tonight. Um, first, who will introduce us, we have the Dean of the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine um, and the Vice President of Health Sciences, Dr. Thomas L. Schwank. We are also joined um, by Dr. Julie Lucero, um, who is an Assistant Professor of Social and Behavioral Health in the Department of Community Health Sciences. She is also the Director of the Latino Research Center at UNR. Dr. Lucero's research is centered on the identification of mo modifiable social determinants to reduce the impact of health inequities within communities of color and other diverse communities. By the way, I am uh, introducing them in the order of appearance here. Um, next, we have Janet Serial. She is the health committee chair of the Reno Sparks NAACP. She's a retired state employee after having served for 30 years in four different divisions in the Department of Health and Human Services. She currently continues as a longtime civil rights and social justice activist and community organizer. Then we have Dr. Bio Curry Winchell. 
She is an alumni of UNR Med's Family Medicine Residency Program. She is currently serving as the director of St. Mary's Urgent Care Clinics, and she is the Washoe County Child Advocacy Center and the Sexual Assault Response Team. Um, she's also active in the White Coats for Black Lives movement. Then we will have uh, Oscar Delgado, who holds dual master's degrees in urban planning and social work from the University of Michigan. Um, he is also the CEO of Community Health Alliance, one of the largest federally qualified uh, community health centers here in Northern Nevada. And he also, in his spare time, serves as the city council member representing Ward 3, uh, which is a community that includes the Wells Avenue area, most of Miralem, and neighbors that are east of UNR, as well as portions of DeMonte Ranch. Then we have Dr. Daryl Patterson, who is a primary care physician at University Health. He is also the chair of the internal medicine department at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. And he serves as one of the diversity workforce champions in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I will be moderating the panel and just contributing here, uh, here and there. Um, but at this point, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Schwenk to help us introduce the topic. Dr. Jacobs, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for organizing this very impressive panel. I was watching the uh, enrollment and the sign-on just grow and grow and jump and jump. We just have a wonderful attendance uh, for this important discussion. Uh, and thanks to the panelists as well. It's a very impressive group, um, which is why my remarks are going to be brief so you can hear from them. Um, this is... Um, sort of the warm-up act. Uh, I'm kind of the warm-up band for the group. Uh, my goal is to set the stage for this discussion uh, with just a little background about the issue of uh, healthcare disparities in general, uh, COVID-19 disparities in particular, the issue of structural racism in, in um, healthcare. Um, economists have talked to us for a long time about the wealth divide and talked about the extreme um, um, divisions of wealth in the country. Um, literally a, a handful of people control as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the, of the population. We all know the, the uh, very tragic numbers about the percentage of families who can afford a $400 unexpected expense. And, and just extraordinary uh, difference from the top end to the bottom end of the economic spectrum. Uh, that led, I think, to uh, more discussion about uh, healthcare disparities and not just economic disparities. And so epidemiologists and public health experts and others started talking about healthcare disparities. I would say as a family physician uh, who has always been active in practice, I, I think that I at least, I think many physicians understood this in theoretical terms. I don't think we really understood this in um, in practical terms, we understood um, that we saw patients with excessive risk and uh, various ways that uh, chronic disease morbidity and early mortality and other issues affected our patients. I'm not sure many of us really thought about it as clearly as we should have, perhaps, uh, what this means for our patients individually as well as our patients as a, a population. But you all know the, the numbers. Uh, we uh, know that Black Americans have a much shorter lifespan uh, than uh, white Americans. We know, for example, that uh, Black women suffer daily uh, racism, and when they're pregnant, uh, this leads to a markedly increased uh, rate of premature delivery uh, and increased uh, uh, incidence of low birth weight babies uh, and uh, two or threefold higher uh, infant mortality than uh, whites, uh, even when other um, economic um, educational factors are uh, controlled for. So I think we, we understood in theory uh, what was happening here. Then the pandemic hit, uh, and then George Floyd was killed. And I think the consequence really uh, uh, come so starkly into our reality and so starkly uh, into our into our day-to-day -day, uh, discussions uh, and and being able even to to just label this as a structural racism 
uh, issue uh, has helped me at least uh, begin to understand uh, what is happening and what we see in the office every day and what my uh, potential role might be. You're going to hear much more in the way of numbers and I won't um, get in the way of that, but simply to say that as we've watched the pandemic develop, uh, what we see is that in terms of risks and severity of illness and hospitalizations and deaths and the, um, the disability that results from, from COVID-19 infections, uh, white Americans are, are advantaged by a factor of two or three or more um, compared to uh, patients of color. And, and there are different ways to slice this, but the, the discrepancies are huge. A couple months ago, I wrote a column, I have a monthly column called Reflections from the Dean, and the July column had to do with this issue and had to do with um, the issue of healthcare disparities. And I um, commented on some of the numbers that I just gave you and some of the concepts I gave you. Um, and I got uh, uh, lots of positive feedback about that. And I also got two uh, very hostile emails from physicians, uh, not the physicians we know, not physicians from Nevada, um, but from elsewhere in the country. And they're very um, um, critical, I would say, of, of the notion of, of uh, Black Lives Matter and the issue of healthcare disparities and the issue of, um, of uh, enhancing the, the healthcare quality and access for uh, patients of color and used the, the usual uh, comment about all lives matter. And that's what they were taught in medical school that all lives matter. And I responded and I said, of course, all lives matter. It's just that some are uh, a bit behind others and we need to uh, bring them up uh, more quickly and, and bring some equity uh, to this issue. And what I learned from that was that th this issue is quite often framed as a zero-sum win-lose uh, kind of equation in which uh, any um, extra effort uh, for certain patients or certain populations is viewed somehow as detracting from efforts for other. This is not a zero-sum game. This is not a win-lose uh, situation. Uh, this is an issue for healthcare professionals uh, to think about ways that we can contribute to, to this so that everyone benefits from our expertise and everyone benefits from our care. So I'll close by uh, saying what I said in this column, which is that there are many ways that we in healthcare can contribute to this issue. And I almost think that we have um, a special advantage here because we can deal with something that is really a very complex political and socioeconomic and historical issue and we can actually deal with it concretely in some very um, um, uh, direct and tangible ways um, that uh, others may, uh, do not have that advantage. So, so I talked a little bit about curriculum development and teaching and education and ways that we could develop courses in health disparities and structural racism. And I talked about how we're experts in research and we could develop new clinical research studies that, that focused uh, especially on uh, patients of color and actually studied this and developed uh, a more scientific approach to understanding these issues. And I talked about how we're experts in clinical care and we could actually develop clinical programs uh, that um, provided um, more uh, specific care and more specific outreach to patients who were suffering from some of these uh, social determinants of health that were uh, disadvantaging them. And I talked about how we're experts in faculty development and there are ways that we could actually enhance the pipeline of faculty members of color and create a more diverse faculty uh, who could contribute to this in, in clinical care and teaching and scientific ways. And finally, I talked about how uh, we are committed to community engagement and there are ways we could reach out. I think we do a fairly good job of that um, as a medical school, but there are ways that we could um, do that more um, uh, assertively. So I'll close with that and just say that I myself have, uh, I think, grown and learned a lot over the last several months as these issues have um, come along. I think that we as a school have ways that we can contribute, but more than that, I think we have an obligation to. Uh, so with that, uh, Dr. Jacobs, thank you. And uh, I look forward to hearing um, all of the expertise on this amazing panel. Thank you, Dr. Schwank, for your very comprehensive uh, introduction. We're so lucky to have you as a leader, and I think you set the stage really nicely for the rest of this conversation.
So with that, we'd like to start by just sharing some data. Um, and Dr. Lucero and Janet Serial will be covering these next few slides. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lucero. Oops, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. So um, for the next three slides, I'm just gonna set the stage of what the COVID cases look like. So these are just focused on active cases, or I'm sorry, on total cases. And this first one shows the percentages of cases for the national data. So I retrieved this from the CDC on September 1st. And I know there's a lot going on here. Um, so just to orient you on the vertical axis are age. And across the bottom are the percentage of populations with the legend on the bottom for race ethnicity. And really what I wanted to show here was that COVID is, is really affecting all age ranges. We have some information out there that maybe young people aren't being affected as much as older folks. And here, I think it shows that, you know, even though the outcome may be less severe for young people, the zero to four age range within the Hispanic Latino community is pretty big. Um, and those are very young children. And this is, you know, in comparison to the American Indian population, Asian, um, the black African American population, and, and even the white population. But one thing that I think that we're doing very well in is protecting our older folks, our seniors, um, our elders. And so you see for the Hispanic population, the number for elders is small, um, less than 10%. And here, you know, within intergenerational families, which mostly Pew Research reports that Hispanic, um, Latino, and Asian populations are the ones to have the most intergenerational living, um, we see that, you know, in those cases, the elders, um, they're, they're being very well protected. Um, but across all age ranges, those that are within the labor force so between 60, and I know this isn't, you know, exact, but between 64 at the high end and 17 or 18 at the low end, all of the populations are being affected. And so, you know, this really does impact, you know, the money that's coming home, the virus that's coming home, um, you know, everything that we know about and that we're going to get into a little bit more in this um, discussion. So next slide, please. So this um, slide is all about Nevada. So this is the state, pot, the state COVID cases um, of Nevada, and these are confirmed cases. I retrieved this information um, for cases um, on Wednesday of this week, so we know that they are changing daily. And on the right hand, right side of your screen, you're seeing the total population per the US Census. Um, of what our population makeup looks like. And so, you know, 48% of our population is white, and yet 28% of cases are among the white population. Um, you know, shockingly, um, for the Hispanic population, we make up 29.2% of total Nevada population, and yet 44% of the cases um, are COVID confirmed cases. And this is true, you know, if you look across the race ethnicity uh, populations within these graphs, you'll see that the race, that the COVID cases far outweigh our population, the population status. Um, and this should really be concerning and it puts us, you know, just shines a light on the disparities, what, you know, when we're in these populations that are essential workers, and, you know, we're in, in situations where we're just more at risk. Now, this is Washoe County specifically, and these are active cases, I'm sorry, total populations of COVID-19 cases. And so the, um, uh, it's the same format. So on the right side, you see the population for Washoe County per the US Census and on I'm sorry, I'm doing this backwards, aren't I? On the left side, population, and then on the right side, total cases. And you see exactly the same thing. So the Latino population is being impacted at a much higher rate, um, but also that's true with all of the other um, racial ethnic groups as well. And so this should really concern us um, in terms of you know, what's going on economically in these households, um, you know, child rearing, family 
watching the children and family taking care of elders, um, who's bringing home and going to work, um, you know, all of the things, like I said before, that we're going to be talking about in the rest of this. So this really just sets the stage for what COVID cases look like. And then now I'll turn it over to Janet. I know that Janet has been having some trouble with her Zoom. Janet, are you able to speak? Okay, I'm here. I just forgot to mute. Thank you, Dr. Liz. Yes, I'm on. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about access to care. And the first slide is that I have up right now um, kind of gives you some data um, regarding um, who, who, um, who are those seeking care um, in, our, in our county. She speaks a language other than English. Uh, approximately 12% of Nevada's populations are seniors, That's people who are 65 years and older, and approximately 11% of Nevada's population is enrolled in Medicaid. Approx out of um, that, after that, approximately one of every 200 people in Nevada is homeless. These are the folks who are, um, out, who are accessing care in our community. Um, and I wanted to speak to that. And later on, I'll get into more details about the impact in terms of from the perspective of, of care out to our, the populations that um, ha, due to lack of health, health insurance has been shown to be the most significant contributing factor to poor quality of care for some of the core measures captured in reports by the Agency for Healthcare and Research and Quality. Um, looking back at my slide, and I apologize, I can't see it very well, um, so I'm going to go to my computer. Shall okay, I so looking at the impact of COVID-19, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Would you like me to advance? Okay. Um, the impact of COVID-19 in Washoe County um, among racial and ethnic minority populations. Um, the death rates already at are um, already at highest at higher risk because of existing pre-existing health conditions. Black and Latino patients tend to receive less aggressive treatment than white patients. Nationwide, the death rate for black Americans and may be higher than the Latino population, even though the infection rate is lower because of the black population being older. So that's where the age issues come into impact. Hospitalization rate rates in terms of COVID-19, black and Latino Americans who are who contract the virus are more likely to suffer from pre-existing conditions, and we'll talk about that later on as well, which increases their risk of severe illness. Um, that the, um, This pop overrepresented among the uninsured. They tend to delay care and, and, and to delay seeking treatment and are sicker than white patients when they finally do um, initiate treatment. Um, uh, inf infection rates among people of color are extremely high and make them more vulnerable. Um, again, um, black and brown communities are more likely to live in crowded housing conditions and to work in essential jobs which cannot be performed from home. Um, low income um, home rates have caused a surge in COVID-19 cases in Washoe County, um, in communities of color, um, particularly in, um, in the um, Asian community, in the African American community, and, and in the Latino communities, we have multi-generational households where they all live together. So you're um, impacting um, people based on age, um, the impact on, of COVID on folks based on age and um, and on income increases higher is higher and remembering most of the families that work or work in um, jobs that require risk for COVID-19. 
going to the next screen, Nevada's uninsured rate by race and ethnicity. I'm just going to kind of look, have everyone look at the slide. It's pretty, 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 pretty telling in the um, in the Hispanic community, the Hispanic community has the highest rate of uninsured, um, at, followed by the African American community, and then the um, um, other racial groups. You can see here that only 14% of um, white households are uninsured. So there's definitely a, a great disparity there. And when you speak to the uninsured, you speak to access and lack of access due to lack of insurance coverage is a big issue and a big um, deterrence from seeking care um, through the normal avenues and seeking early care. So that contributes to the high rates of um, COVID in our communities. And let's see. Next, we're going to look at minorities in healthcare, and I just want to kind of Janet, I think you cut out. Can other folks hear me? Okay, I, I might just pick up this slide because um, I think I know what she's trying to get at which is that the, the, the number of minorities in healthcare proportionally does not reflect the communities that we serve. So there, there is um, a shortage of African Americans in medicine, um, Hispanics in medicine, um, whereas we see 50% um, of the physician workforce is, um, is Caucasian. And so really having, um, having more minorities in medicine and or in healthcare in general um, is, is an area that we uh, will talk about a little bit more later. And I'm sorry that we lost Janet there. All right, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Curry Winchell. She's gonna talk with us about systemic racism as well as social determinants of health and healthcare disparities. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you first and foremost for joining us. Um, so I'm, I'm here to discuss this health and the impacts of COVID-19. Systemic racism in medicine, this concept was first named during the civil rights movement of the 1960s and was further refined in the 1980s. It describes disparity, whether it's to describe access to care, employment, criminal justice, education, or housing. It's a reference to the systems in place that create and maintain racial inequality in nearly every facet of life for people of color. <clears throat> An example of systemic racism is redlighting, which refers to a system that was used by banks and the real estate industry in the 20th century to determine which neighborhoods would get loans to buy homes. The neighborhoods you see outlined in red ink were deemed the riskiest to invest in. These areas are outlined in red, outlined in red were identified as high risk areas, which were predominantly communities of color. This created an environment where minorities were unable to get loans to build their community, which impacted their ability to build wealth for their families. This allowed communities to remain in poverty, resulting in a lower access to healthcare, education, housing, and opportunities. This is why structural racism is a public health crisis. Recently on August 5th, 2020, Governor Sisolak proclaimed racism as a public health crisis. Governors around the nation, just like Governor Sisolak, recognize the importance of acknowledging structural racism and the impact it can leave, it can have on health um, outcomes in our community. Next, what I'd like to talk about is social determinants of health. And the reason why I made the decision to really define structural racism and social determinants of health, it's amazing how much those words actually encompass so many different things. So when we talk about social determinants of health, it represents the conditions that are in place where people live, learn, work, and play that can affect a wide range of health and quality of life. The distribution of money, power, and resources at national and local levels can have a huge effect, which is why social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health inequities. 
For example, children born to parents who have not completed high school are more likely to live in an environment that involves a lack of safety in their neighborhoods, substandard education, and housing. They are also less likely to have access to parks, playgrounds, recreation centers, or libraries. Addressing social determinants of health is not only important for improving overall health, but it also helps reduce health disparities that are often rooted in social and economic disadvantages. Next, we're gonna talk about the impact of COVID-19. Prior to COVID-19, people of color were more likely to be uninsured and face barriers to accessing healthcare. Due to lower incomes and financial challenges, this increased their risk for a higher rate of health conditions, including contracting COVID-19. Those who contracted COVID-19 were more likely to have complications because they lacked access or were delayed in receiving care. Next, I wanna talk about a common term since the pandemic, which is work from home or telecommuting. The definition of what it means to work from home has made our country more aware of the existing workforce gap. Now it's important to mention this option isn't available to everyone. Remote work is particularly common among university graduates, managers, and professionals. Finance, for example, compared to manufacturing, is more suitable to remote work. If you do not fall into this category, you automatically have an increased risk of contracting COVID-19, and minorities are much more likely to fall into this category, which further increases our risk for contracting COVID-19. Next, I'm gonna talk about the inequities of the judicial system. The criminal justice system is often associated with the correlation of blackness and criminality in a way that affects the entire black population, especially the entire black male population. If you look at the underserved white community, it's reviewed as impoverished and black neighborhoods are often referred to as dangerous. A recent study by Harvard Magazine reported African-American participants paid bigger penalties for having criminal records than whites did. Data has shown black people are punished at a higher rate and spend more times in jail than their white counterparts. Next, I'd like to discuss the education gap. As the COVID-19 crisis continued, students turned to remote learning at home. Before the coronavirus, Black and Latinx children were already less likely to have access to high quality education. Even before the pandemic, researchers identified a significant racial funding gap in education related to the reliance on property taxes as the main support for school funding. Now with remote learning, minority populations are less likely to have access to remote learning tools, which has taken away their ability to even access subpar education. Food insecurity and housing. Underserved families whose children relied on a meal during school had to find a way to provide meals for their children during the quarantine. The money they used to pay for the extra meals had an impact on their ability to pay for housing, bills, and transportation. Next, I wanna talk about medical research. Medicine often fails to include communities of colors and algorithms, robust practices of identifying and treatment of a disease. For example, uh, information was released about a new dermatological effect seen in pediatric patients associated with COVID-19, referred to as COVID toes. Even though COVID-19 disproportionately affects Blacks and the Latinx population, it did not include images of black or darker skin. Instead, almost all images on display are of Caucasians. Next, I wanna talk about the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis, which lasted from 1932 to 1972, 40 years. The study recruited 600 black men, of which 399 were diagnosed with syphilis and 201 were a control group without the disease. The researchers never obtained informed consent from the men and never told the men with syphilis that they were not being treated but were simply being watched until they died. Their bodies were used to gain information on the disease. I'd like for you to take notice of the small picture titled Free Blood Tests, Free Treatment by the, by the County Health Department. 
this is an example of past behavior that breeds mistrust for medicine and minorities. Between the 1930s and the 1970s, approximately one third of the female population of Puerto Rico was sterilized, making it the highest rate of sterilization in the world. Population control targeted towards Latinx populations was not only prevalent in Puerto Rico, it was actually also common in California. Increased sterilization procedures was a targeted practice to decrease the high level of poverty and unemployment. The promotion of sterilization was marketed as the best form of birth control. Family clinics could be found in factories that provided free sterilization thanks to a USAID grant. Through this program, Latinx women became participants in US pharmaceutical companies research on developing a modern birth control pill called Falicove. The reason why I put those two images, the Tuskegee as well as the image that you see in front of you, it's another very powerful example of mistrust that exists in communities of color. The two examples mentioned are reminders to healthcare providers on the importance of acknowledging your patient's race and culture when providing care. Many providers have asked themselves, including myself, why is my patient not compliant? The lack of compliance might not be related to a history of, the, the lack of compliance might be related to a history of fear associated with health institutions and the government. And I really hope that last line really makes an impact to the panel and to the group that are listening. I know it makes an impact to the panel, but that was something that um, I really wanted to stress um, during this event. Thank you, Dr. Curry Winchell. And so at this point, hopefully we have this background of some of the data, what some of the issues are, what some of the social determinants that um, led to and also exacerbated some of the disparities that we see with COVID-19. So at this point, I'd like to switch gears and have our panel talk a little bit about what different um, uh, members of the panel are who, and, and the communities that they re represent, what they are doing. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Curry Winchell, um, to talk about what St. Mary's is doing. Thank you, Nicole. So St. Mary's mission, first and foremost, is always I wanted to highlight um, some of those partnerships that we have um, actually active. And the first one is we have a partnership with Access to Healthcare. And this is an organization that provides meals and transportation to the underserved. Next, I wanted to talk about is COVID testing. St. Mary's has been providing COVID testing through a drive-through service, as well as through all four urgent care clinics. And the reason why I like to mention that, we have three in Reno, but we also have one in Sparks. And it was very interesting as far as COVID testing when we had the drive-through, it provide, provided access for patients. If you didn't have a vehicle, you could actually walk up and get tested. And I think that's something as well that we need to talk about for the future, that St. Mary's is actually acknowledging we need to be able to provide access to everyone, whether you have a vehicle or not. At all of our urgent cares, we do accept Medicaid. And we have also partnered with Community Triage Center as well as um, other local hospitals here. Now, mental health care is very, very important to St. Mary's as well as to the community hospitals. But we've actually um, set up a way for patients to access um, mental health. Um, and that also goes for the uh, homeless population. And last thing I wanna talk about the Downtown Reno Partnership and the Karma Box. This has allowed um, people to have access to toiletries on demand, very easy access, as well as the partnership with Downtown Reno Partnership has provided ambassadors to really provide hands-on care in our community. Next, I'm gonna talk about workforce diversity efforts. 
So education, we have been talking about structural um, racism and social determinants of health. And so our thoughts are, how can we make a change? And so I think it always starts with education. I think that's huge. So um, it's important that we mention exposure and opportunity to careers in medicine um, through mentorship programs and face-to-face -face interaction with children. I think this should start at preschool and elementary school because this can provide visibility into opportunities a child may not have thought was possible based on their environment. We also know many studies have shown race matching can improve patient outcomes. Important for hospitals and clinics to mirror the patient population they serve in order to improve best practices for diagnosis and treatment. If we also use the same concept to provide opportunities to communities of color, this could result in more opportunities across the board. Representation. Sorry, I'm almost done. <laughs> when looking at a workforce, it's very important um, to look at not only at minority involvement from an overall perspective, but also to look at executive and leadership representation as well. The questions that you should be asking yourself, is there diversity in our C-suite with our vice presidents, directors, or high level managers? If you only look at Overall numbers, your organization might be continuing to relegate minorities to low end or entry level positions. Providing representation sets the foundation for minorities to strive and or see themselves in a field that may be underrepresented by their race. Lastly, I leave with, leave, um, with the important topic to ask organizations, companies, hospitals, board positions on how many minorities you have in these positions and what opportunities are you providing to those groups in your organization? Because in the end, having diversity in your leadership team breeds innovation and new perspectives to light, which could lead to growth in new areas your organization may not have been looking at. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Oscar Delgado, who will speak to um, the efforts of Community Health Alliance, as well as the city of Reno. Thank you to, of course, all the panelists. It's truly an honor to be, to be with all of you. And I thank you to all those that have tuned in. Appreciate everyone's time and effort to learn more about our community and, and how you can help. Um, thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, we'll jump to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So I know Dr. Lucero already kind of went over this quite a bit, but just again, wanted to highlight, this is as of today, uh, what Washoe County is looking at. And they also have a tab that you can look at in terms of those, the ethnic, uh, uh, what's happening with our ethnic groups here in town. Of course, we saw earlier to also in the PowerPoint, the 44% uh, impact in the Latino community. I'd like to argue that it's probably higher than that. And the reason I'd, I'd argue that is that we have a large segment of our community that will not go get tested or seek services because of the public charge issues and just some of the national discussions that really keep people home or afraid to seek government services. So I'd argue that it's, it's, it's a little bit more than 44%. Um, uh, and then the public charge, for those that don't know what the public charge is, it's basically if anyone have a, has documentation, has a green card, has, uh, if you go and seek certain services, that may actually be a ding against you from receiving citizenship. And so it's a, it's a constant influx with our current administration, whether it's going during some points and sometimes it's pulled back and so forth. But ultimately, a lot of people in our community would rather feel safer than not and not seek services until possibly the administration changes. So again, I'd argue that it's higher than 44%. Change the slide. Um, just saw the comment pop up. I'd like to rec uh, recognize Nate Hilton from Senator Rosen's office. Thanks for, for being on here. Also represented from Senator Rosen's office. So what is Reno doing? Um, as you guys can see, we are quickly and every day pivoting according to what the governor allows for us to do. We're a, uh, you know, we, we, we're a creature of the state, so we're only allowed to do so much. They give us guidance and we've got to abide by those guidances and we'll do the best we can to, of course, uh, make sure that we're safe, but at the same time, we understand there's an economic impact that's taking place across our community. And also at the same time, not just thinking economics, but a safety aspect. And so 
I think you'll find with my colleagues and the mayor that we're trying the best we can to be as broad as we can, but as safe as we can with this, these changing times. And so it's frustrating for many, but we're, we're doing the best we can. But again, we have to follow all the state guidelines from what Governor Sisolak has, has, has given and provided for us. Uh, CARES funding, uh, hopefully for all those that are following what the city of Reno is going to be doing with our basically $46 million is we've outlined two different phases in terms of how those dollars are going to be spent. A lot of that is going to be focused on, on housing, uh, that we've allowed a portion of that about 2.5 million, no, close to, no, sorry, 5 million, 2.5 million is going to be used for people in their current homes to keep them housed. Uh, the other half is going to be used for homeless shelters and also, uh, and also to help with our homeless shelters and also those that are staying in our weekly hotels. Uh, right now, it's, it's, it's evident that if you don't have shelter, and again, shelter is, 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 is health. If you don't have shelter, then you have the elements, and we know that the changing climate is gonna play a big part in that. Um, so we're using those dollars to keep people housed as much as we can. We've also allocated about two and a half million dollars for our small businesses. Um, hopefully you'll see the audacity organization is going to come out working with small businesses and minority owned businesses to help them keep their lights on and keep their businesses flowing. Uh, please, if you have the opportunity, go to our local restaurants. Um, they are some of our, in our retail stores, they are some of our most uh, impacted, but also employ some of the most people in our community. Uh, this uh, healthcare issue is, is also impacting our, our communities in terms of economics, in terms of making sure they keep a shelter uh, uh, over their heads. Next one is, um, of course, if you know, I'm talking to uh, the choir here, but please follow. Uh, everything is changing all the time. So go to COVID19Washington.com. That's where you'll learn more about the changing dynamics, the changing policies, where we currently stand. Please educate your, your colleagues and your families about why we're doing what we're doing. A lot of the times you may follow your news feeds on Facebook or social media, and sometimes those news feeds aren't correct. So help, help us keep making sure that people stay informed with the right information. Contract tracing, uh, we're excited for that in the sense we're making sure that people understand who's being impacted. The more we're informed, the better off we are and the safer we are. Um, I know it's somewhat of a, uh, an, not a, I won't say an inconvenience, but it's, it's hard to go and say that I, I may be positive, right, with, with COVID. Uh, my hope is that we change the conversation and say, if you feel your call, your you may have COVID or you have the symptoms, uh, don't be afraid to make sure you call and let people know. It's the right thing to do. Let's keep our community safe and let's also empower those that may have those symptoms to say, it's okay, you should go get tested, you know, call, stay quarantined, stay home until we know better. Uh, you know, people feel as though it's, it's, it's gonna stick with them or anything else in the sense where it's a bad thing, it's not. And empower yourselves, empower the community, let them know to go get tested. Um, one thing that we know that's been highlighted across the way is we need to do a better job communicating. And I think you hear that everywhere is what are we communicating? Um, and we've done the best we can, but we know that we're also working with our other jurisdictions, Washington County and the city of Sparks. One thing that we've elevated is definitely our Spanish outreach. Uh, it's been a number of years in the works of making sure that a large percentage of our community, which are Spanish speaking, are more and better informed with the information that's being presented by Dr. Lucero and Dr. Curry Winchell and Janet earlier is that um, they are being impacted dramatically and we wanna make sure that they are informed with how to best care for themselves and for their families. Um, and one thing that I carry heavy on my shoulders, of course, is making sure that we continue and hopefully with the support of all of you is that we uh, look at all policy through a healthcare lens. Um, and, and what I mean by that is if you're an urban planner if you're an attorney, if you're a business owner, if uh, you're an environmentalist, that you try to look at your specialty or the, your work or the work that you're doing through a healthcare lens. How is that impacting you and your family and the environment around you? And I'm sure there are tons of ways that we can do a better job. And if you have great ideas or any way you can, please shoot me an email. Uh, I don't know everything and uh, I'd love to have more conversations with all of you and how we can do a better job. And lastly, of course, I'm going to throw this to Dr. Lucero is uh, in the immediate, we often are reactive and we are in many different ways reactive now, but something that we're doing in the immediate right now is gaining as much information as we can so we can continue to do better. And so if you have an opportunity, please pass a survey on that's there at the bottom of the screen and help the Latino Research Center for 
we'll get that information so we're better informed and also we know where to allocate those resources for our communities that are being impacted. Chance slide. So a little, about about, a little bit about Community Health Alliance. Uh, Community Health Alliance is an FQHC, which is a federally qualified health center. We're really, FQHC started back in the 60s as a way of a war against poverty. It was an idea of getting health centers into communities of need, into vulnerable communities. And that's where you'll find uh, on those zip codes there at the bottom why we are where we are. Uh, one of my great partners is, is Northern Nevada Hopes. Uh, through Sharon Chamberlain, another FQHC here in Washoe County that do a tremendous amount of great work. Uh, what you'll see here is that we have seven clinics throughout Washoe County. And what we've done here on the left map is where you'll see those hotspots about where active locations are. And if you see here on the right side where locations are, are centered is we're in, the, we're in these communities. We're serving these um, our mission and vision is to make sure that we provide health care and access to health care to everyone, no matter what, and we don't turn anyone away. Um, one thing that we may be, that a lot of people don't know is we're a pretty large organization. We have about, we serve close to anywhere between 25 to 30,000 patients a year. We have over 45 providers from MDs, PAs, uh, nurses, dentists, dental hygienists, licensed clinical social workers, the whole nine, and we're there to provide services for Again, our most vulnerable. At the same time, even our commercial patients, we don't turn anyone away. If you jump to the next slide. Basically covered what we're, what we're saying here. Um, one of the important factors too that's important to me is that we reflect the communities we represent and try and do better. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm proud of is that about 80% of our workforce are bilingual, bicultural. And I think that's an important piece in terms of making sure and reassuring tr trust and honesty with the communities we're serving. Uh, again, uh, we are in communities uh, predominantly of, of people of color and minorities, such as the Neal Road community, Wells, uh, Northeast Reno, basically West Parks, um, and North Valleys, Sun Valley. So that's where we'll find, again, the, the research that was presented earlier. These are communities of color, these are zip codes. Um, that we belong in and we want to provide services in. And if anyone ever wants to take, take a tour, we'll, we'll arrange that so you better understand what we, what we do and how we serve them. But one of our guiding principles also is the social determinants of health. We understand that it's not um, just an ailment that may put you in the situation you are, it's your environment, it's the lives you live. And so when COVID hit, uh, we knew really quickly that our doors weren't going to close. We've got to figure, figure out how we continue to serve the communities we serve and make sure we do it in a safe manner. So but one of the things that we saw dramatically increase of a need was our food pantry. We, we have a food house clinic where we work with Northern Nevada Food Bank and we work with Urban Roots and other urban farms in our communities that donate food uh, to us. And we make sure that we prescribe that food to our patients, especially if they're diabetic or if they have other types of ailments. And so, there's opportunities that we co-partners with others because we can't do it alone. Uh, what we also know is we seek out partners and sometimes, and, and they seek out us. One of those great opportunities is working with St. Mary's earlier this year where they came, to, where we were able to get together and we were able to open our clinic in North Valleys. Uh, North Valleys didn't have a clinic that served the Medicaid populations and so forth. And we were able to work with them, partner with them. And now uh, we have a clinic there that's thriving we're able to provide uh, access to healthcare and also behavioral health to those families in North Valley. So very excited about that partnership. In addition to that, we work with Renown Health. Uh, right now, we're able to send our patients to Renown Health to get pretty quick turnaround COVID testing. It's important for us because we all, and important to them, of course, because many times as essential workers, they are also the breadwinners in their homes. Uh, so they need to know if they're sick or not, uh, not only for their own safety and the others in their home, but also to make sure they get a paycheck. Uh, quite often, uh, those essential workers don't have uh, PTO or sick time or anything like that. If they don't show up, they don't get paid. If they don't get paid, they can't pay the bills. If they can't pay the bills and they're worried about their shelter, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we wanna try and work as best we can with our partners to get them uh, tested as quick as they can so they can get back to their lives as fast as they can. Um, other partners, of course, we have not only Healthcare World, but we're also working with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, you know, that's a great fit for us because those are the demographics and the families that we work with. So we want to make sure early on that we've established relationships and trusted relationships with those families so they can continue to seek 
services from us. And then we also learn from them in terms of how we can change the services that we need to to better support the community. You can change the slide there. Mm -hmm. uh, another way is that we're able to adapt is grow. Right now, our clinic in Sparks, in the city of Sparks, we have the, we only, there's only one clinic in Sparks, and that's us, and that's over in the, uh, the northwest uh, part of town. I grew up two blocks down the street from that health center. Very proud of the health center, but it's also uh, uh, at capacity. So uh, we are remodeling and we're expanding. Very excited about that expansion to better serve more families in that community. Uh, we're working again with uh, many different, not just health facilities, but also businesses and receiving donations. And that was one way that we were able to receive a tremendous amount of PPE from uh, Z-Line. They came and they gave us thousands upon thousands of masks that we were able to go back and give back out to our families. So when they came and saw us uh, as patients, we were able to also make sure that they walked away with masks that not only for themselves, but also for the kids, families, and their homes if they didn't have one or if they were just overused. Um, and lastly, we, we work with the state quite a, uh, quite a bit in terms of making sure that uh, we're able to evaluate a patient when they come in, not only for their health, but also, again, for other resources that they may be eligible for, such as WIC, or just making sure they get on the, the Nevada Health Exchange so they get better coverage uh, for Medicaid or for other services. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, Dr. Jacobs, that's us, but I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A at the end to answer as many questions as I can. So again, thank you. It's a great example of comprehensive care all in one site. And, and I would take him up on his offer because I did that and I was just blown away, um, particularly for any of our uh, medical students who are thinking about how to set up a practice in the future. Um, I really encourage you to take a tour because seeing how they do it and how they address all the social determinants is really um, just will blow your mind away. All right. So I don't know if Janet is back as she's poor thing is having all kinds of, of trouble with Wi-Fi. Janet, are you here? And I am back online. Okay, good. I'm it's, here. Um, so it is your turn to let us know what the NAACP is doing. Okay. All right. Well, the, um, the NAACP, I want to just give you a little history on, on who we are and what we do. We, uh, the NAACP was founded, is, is NAACP stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Color People. Um, we are the nation's oldest and um, foremost civil rights organization. We are a civil rights organization. Our mission is to ensure equal political, educational, social, and economic rights for all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. So we are not a service organization. We are a civil rights organization. This mission includes a focus on the right of African Americans and other people of color to have optimal health outcomes and access to timely, quality, affordable health care. The NAACP has a historic commitment to closing the gap in health disparities across the nation is committed to eliminating the racial and ethnic inequities that exist within our healthcare system that undermine communities of color and their life opportunities and their ability to contribute fully to the common good. Um, as a chair of the NAACP Health Committee, I just want to mention that our work is centered around Oh dear, it looks like we've lost Janet again. Um, let me see. Yeah, I think she froze up here. Um, let me see if we can skip these slides and then go back to them if she's able to rejoin us. I apologize for these technical issues here, everyone. Um, so can, uh, I guess this is me, so I will go next. Um, to let you know a little bit about the efforts that UNR Med is undertaking, um, and this is through the Admissions and Student Affairs as well as through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So as Dr. Curry Winchell mentioned before, um, it's, it's really important to have um, a healthcare workforce that um, kind of mirrors the populations that they serve. And as you saw from the numbers before, we definitely 
don't, don't have that parity. And we also know that there can be better healthcare outcomes um, when there is that um, racial matching. And we also know that, um, that uh, people from certain communities are much more likely to serve those communities. So at UNR Med, we have something called mission-based diversity groups, um, and they are not just race-based, although they do include races, but they're also like uh, folks from rural Nevada. We know that people that come from rural Nevada are much more likely to go back and serve patient populations in rural Nevada, and so they are one of our mission-based diversity groups. Um, but we really try to diversify the workforce with respect to our mission-based diversity groups. Um, our admissions and student affairs office does all kinds of outreach efforts in order to try to increase interest in um, STEM as well as in healthcare professions. We have a number of pipeline programs going all the way up to faculty. Um, so we, have, we work with a number of undergraduate programs um, on our campus as well as on some other campuses. Um, we try to get them um, better prepared to be more competitive to get admission to medical school and that's the pre-med clinic. We have a BSMD program, a post -bac program, and we work with the TRIO Scholars Program. Um, Dr. Derringer and I run what's called the ADAM program. This is the Academy for Development in Academic Medicine. Here we work with residents and graduate students who are um, already in, in, uh, in uh, medicine um, or interested in um, serving in academic medicine. And we try to teach them how to be better faculty members and get them interested in careers in academic medicine. Um, we have a workforce diversity champion program. Um, Dr. Patterson is one of those champions. Dr. Lombardero is another one. Here we work to build partnerships with historically black colleges and universities, as well as Hispanic serving institutions that have residency programs and medical schools to try to connect with them to try to recruit medical students into our residency programs and then residents into our uh, faculty positions. We are using a holistic review, which in addition to looking at things like MCAT scores and GPA, we try to develop balanced consideration of um, other things that might be important. So leadership, um, barriers that have been overcome, and to what extent is this person able to, um, to contribute towards all of the missions of our School of Medicine, one of which is around a culture of diversity and inclusion. Um, we have implicit bias training, which all members of admissions committees, as well as all members of all search committees, go through implicit bias training to make sure that we are not creating additional barriers in order to bring people into our workforce. And UNR Med tracks data very, very carefully looking at diversity. We look to see who's applying, who gets interviews, who accepts our offers. Um, and then once they're here, who stays and who thrives, who is getting promoted, who is getting leadership positions. So we track all of that and try to make sure that we have parity in all of those areas. Um, once folks are here, we have all kinds of efforts in order to try to increase the cultural humility um, and competence of the workforce, of the healthcare workforce. We do implicit bias assessments for all students in the PA program, as well as all medical students take multiple assessments of their own implicit bias and they get feedback on the different areas that they may have some of those hidden biases. And we also provide them with training on how to um, be aware of and mitigate those biases particularly in healthcare settings. That's a curriculum that's also woven in um, for both the medical school and the PA program. We have, um, when students get into their clerkship years, this is like in year three, we have um, SP stands for standardized patient assessments where we actually look at their ability to demonstrate cultural humility and empathy. So we try to make sure that all of this training is in the service of having better outcomes. Um, we just developed a medical Spanish um, and cultural humility elective for fourth year medical students that we're really excited about. Um, and brand new and hot off the presses also is this scholarly concentration in medical social justice. This is a little bit more research based, but it's aimed at getting students out into the community and looking at how research can um, help to uh, offer different solutions and then trying to implement those solutions in order to improve outcomes for members of our community. 
Um, we also have all kinds of trainings in order to increase the, the cultural sensitivity of the workforce. We have safe zone training for working with our LGBT patient population. We have trainings on microaggressions and bystander intervention through my office. Um, every month we have a diversity dialogue. We had one earlier today at noon. Um, and we talked about how to be an anti-racist. Um, we watched some videos um, from Dr. Ibram Kendi, which were great. We have the Diversity Health Series, of which this is the first of our quarterly series. Um, we also have a yearly event called the Inclusive Medicine Series. And then we have affinity groups that students as well as faculty can participate in. We have the Student National Medical Association, which is for African American um, physicians, the Latino Medical Student Association, our LGBT student interest group. AppAMSA is for Asian Pacific Islander, and that uh, American Medical Student Association, uh, American Medical Women's Association, and then GWIMS is the group on women in medicine and science. And so all of those groups are, are aimed at um, uh, supporting one another and also increasing the diversity of the workforce as well as teaching cultural humility. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Patterson um, to talk a little bit about what UNR Med is doing in terms of our university health, our patient care. Dr. Patterson. Hey, thank you, Nicole, and, and thank you for the opportunity to share what UNR Med and University Health are doing um, to impact health disparities. University Health is UNR Med's practice plan and offers uh, clinical services, and, and hopefully during this discussion, um, the audience can share their initiatives or ideals to improve upon their efforts. Um, so we have outreach clinics uh, in underserved areas that partner with local health organizations in providing medical services. The population served are those who have obstacles to adequate health care, and the services are free uh, and include screening, vaccinations, and disease management. Um, patients are assisted with local resources to address their health concerns. Um, we have satellite, uh, satellite clinics at University Health are located throughout Washoe County, and they include primary care, comprehensive geriatrics, OBGYN, and psychiatric services. Our clinics accept uh, the majority of insurance plans, including Medicaid and the uninsured. Um, we emphasize that our providers utilize evidence-based uh, uh, practice or care in practice. Evidence-based medicine can reduce uh, clinician bias and stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And adherence to evidence-based guidelines allows clinicians to make decisions uh, that are founded on current research findings, minimizing conscious or unconscious uh, decisions based on bias or stereotypes. UNR Med and, and University Health adapted clinical operations very early in the pandemic to meet the needs of those vulnerable to health disparities. Um, namely, um, we kept our mental health and primary care services um, and as Janet mentioned, there are major issues for um, disadvantaged individuals in our communities. Uh, to respond to the challenges in healthcare created by the pandemic, uh, we quickly responded by developing uh, a telemedicine platform um, in all of our clinics using either Zoom video conferencing um, or phone visits. And as Bio mentioned, uh, cultural sensitivity is crucial in minimizing disparities uh, to minimize language and cultural barriers. Uh, UH and UNR Med clinics provide health education handouts uh, in multiple languages, and we also provide translation services to minimize those same um, language barriers. Our faculty, our residents, and students participate in QI projects uh, within their practices, focusing mostly on improving patient health outcomes. Uh, for example, we've had residents produce quality improvement projects uh, in improving patient compliance and figuring out resources to kind of minimize uh, barriers uh, for compliance. And then also uh, diabetes, coronary disease screening, tobacco abuse. Now, as Bio also mentioned, uh, similar to the business model and business industry, uh, healthcare team diversity improves health outcomes in patients. And UH actively promotes the hiring of diverse groups of individuals responsible for caring for our community. And this includes staff, residents, and faculty. Residents and students are educated in patient-centered uh, communication. Patient-centered care improves disease outcomes and quality of life uh, and is critical uh, to addressing racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in health care and outcomes. And now Dr. Jacobs will comment on UNR Med's research efforts. 
for it. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. So we are lucky to have uh, some basic scientists as well as some clinical translational researchers on board. Um, Dr. Ruben Dagda, um, he has initiated this CBEST program, which is the Community of Bilingual yeah, English Spanish speakers program. It is aimed at getting um, people who speak Spanish interested in uh, careers in healthcare. And, um, and we also have an implicit bias research group that again um, has developed the implicit bias assessments and the curriculum. And we are assessing the impact of that curriculum across time on our medical students, as well as on the PA program. We're also looking at the impact of implicit bias training for, um, for the admissions committees and the, um, the search committees. Uh, the Latino Research Center that Dr. Lucero runs um, is also very active, um, very um, engaged in the community. And then we have some research pilot funding um, as well through programs like um, INBRE and CTRIN. So at this point, we're running a little bit behind. I'm just letting the panelists know that. So, but I'd like to, you know, now that we've outlined what the issues are and what some of um, some of uh, the actions that we're taking um, through our different programs in the community, I'd like to end on a note of recommendations that can be taken by the folks who are listening here today. And we've divided this by recommendations around uh, dismantling systemic racism, um, recommendations for the community and institutional recommendations, as well as recommendations for individual providers. So Dr. Lucero, can you talk with us a little bit about uh, dismantling systemic racism? Sure, so this is, you know, I, I, we need to know what to do, right? I mean, this is a huge problem. Um, this is a complex task. There is no one size fits all for, you know, the recipe of how to dismantle systematic racism. Um, the first thing that we need to do really is acknowledge that it exists and how does it exist within your community, um, community being thought of, you know, in, in its broadest sense. It requires communication, coordination, overall buy-in. Once we have, you know, all agreed that this really is an issue, it really does exist, then we need everybody to come to the table to, um, to make a change. Um, it requires this equity lens so that we're not, you know, as Dr. As our opening comments um, shed a light on, you know, there are some people that aren't really thinking about it in terms of equity and, and, and what they're thinking about is taking resources from one place and giving it to the other, right? And making disparities sort of go the opposite way. And we know that's not the case. It, it's not taking away from, it's not redistribution. Um, it's really just looking at equity um, and providing resources in, in, in an equal equality fashion so that everybody gets, you know, that what, what everybody deserves to have the best opportunity. Um, and so one size, you know, as I said, doesn't fit all. And so we need to really look at it um, from a local perspective so that, you know, it's not an issue for politics. We can't wait for politics to make a change for us. Instead, we need to identify what some of the fundamental issues are, or the fundamental causes, and make a change that best meets our own communities. Um, an extra burden often within organizations is it gets placed on my underrepresented groups. So the, the person or the people that are from an underrepresented group are required to fix. They're the ones that are going to fix the issue. And it just puts more of a burden on those individuals when really it's an issue for everybody. Um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color often experience neglect within their organizations. Um, so we, we recruit, we bring in diversity, and then we sort of forget about them. And that's not the way for people to thrive, right? So we need to acknowledge that once we bring diversity into the door, we have to do everything that we can to keep them there. Um, just like um, Bio said earlier, diversity breeds innovation. And organizations like Coca-Cola have done such a fantastic job of this, and they are, have moved far and beyond competitors we should be learning from that. You know, for us, it's not necessarily about economics, but it is about maintaining or achieving that health equity for um, our, the people that we're working for. 
Um, understand and tackle bias, and uh, Nicole has mentioned this already, create spaces for, for professionals to speak freely and honestly. Um, and so that's really coming from the top, right? Making sure that those that are in leadership create a, a situation, a space, so that everybody can say what they're comfortable with, not uncomfortable with, and then address it together. And then the last one is recognize the impact of research on reinforcement or dismantling of bias and stereotypes. Um, we've all heard the term super predators. That actually came from a criminologist and political scientist. Um, so, you know, that came from research and it got switched around and kind of went sideways, but that was, it came from research. The other thing that we're not doing is, um, for example, American Indians, we don't have the data that tells us really where the problems are at. Instead, they're starred with an asterisk and compiled with other data. So we don't really know what is going on. And we know that every research grant that we need has to be data informed. If we don't have the data, then we are doing this, right? We're reinforcing instead of dismantling these biases and stereotypes. And then recommendations for the community. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, think about community in the broadest sense. So community is a group of individuals that are tied together by proximity. So in a neighborhood or in an organization. So we have communities of physicians, communities of scientists, but also tied together by interests or characteristics. So the Latino community, the Black African American community, for example. And so um, so I'm looking at it at the, in the broadest sense. And so for a community, what we can do is to get involved, right? And so vote for government, but also for your organizational leaders. Here at UNR, we just had a series of interviews with potential presidents. So get involved, right? See what they're all about and try to, um, you know, put forward your opinion on, on who should be the best person for those jobs. Take on leadership roles. Um, we're always kind of waiting for somebody to do it for us, right? And so why don't we take the leadership role and, and make it happen so that we can make change within our communities. Um, make diversity and inclusion an agenda. Diversity and inclusion is not an initiative. It is not a program. It is an agenda that runs through every single part of our lives. And so let's treat it that way, right? Um, we can volunteer or donate. So volunteer our time, donate food, donate our time, um, you know, just so that we're, we're working towards. And then um, urge schools to integrate diversity into the curriculum. And I'm talking about diversity in terms of everybody's history. Um, we are lacking Latino history in our school curriculum, Black African American history, American Indian history in our curriculum so that those voices and those stories aren't heard. And so, um, so we kind of forget about them. And so we need to make sure that we have those and then read about race. I read a fantastic book by Brittany Cooper, um, who is a black feminist. And it is incredible to hear other people's experiences. Um, but also if you don't want to read about it, but you're curious about things, the internet, you can learn all kinds of things um, about terms, you know, like the his, the, our pronouns, why are, we, why are we throwing pronouns on our signatures these days? Um, but ultimately, what I want you to take away from this is silence is the voice of, of complacency. If we are silent, then we are giving the power um, away and we're not letting, you know, our own voices heard. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucero. Um, and at this point, I'm turning it back over to Dr. Patterson to talk about institutional and individual recommendations. Okay. All right. So, so for the sake of time, uh, that my slides are pretty obvious, and my and my panelists have pretty much already um, uh, made uh, comments um, that were pretty much in line with what I was going to say. And Dr. Lucero uh, finished that up very well. I don't have much to add to that. I, I would I would say one thing. Um, I think um, wh whether you make a moral case, um, a social responsibility or business case, it's important to address disparities and qualities as an issue. So you, in, in our minds, we have to figure out what motivation um, will motivate us or um, stimulate us to, to, to make a change. Consider adding whatever your objectives are for 
disparities or anti-racist systems um, to be abolished, consider taking those objectives and combining them into your corporations or your um, organization's social responsibility objectives. And then match your objectives to your institution's values and mission-based strategy. And if you do that, it's a little bit easier to find an area where you would like to focus uh, to, to make change. And then your goals uh, should be promoted by the highest level of leadership. Everyone here is interested in this topic. And I think everyone has their reasons to, to impact um, health disparities. But I think once you establish what your objectives are, you have to define measurable objectives and track your performance. And if you aren't meeting your objectives, you need to realign your efforts into something that's um, uh, a little bit more effective. So I would just say, really make sure that you understand your objectives and measure your outcomes um, and, and you can make things change. Thank you. All right, an individual. Uh, yeah, I, so for um, the individual, I, I think again, this is uh, kind of already been said. Um, I think uh, you, you can participate in implicit bias or cultural competency um, training. I think that's effective. Um, for us that have electronic medical record templates, you can use those or other screening tools to evaluate mental health issues in your patients so you can identify social determinants of health. Um, use translators uh, and language sensitive patient handouts um, and utilize patient centered communication techniques when you can. And that's essentially establishing rapport, eliciting your patient needs, getting their story on the table, sharing information and then definitely responding to emotions um, when noted and then share decision-making. And then get involved with the community organizations and your legislators um, to see what you can do um, to help in reducing some of the dis uh, disparities. And for those that have the infrastructure, telehealth services are an excellent way to overcome some of those um, social determinants of health. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Patterson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for shedding light on what the issues are and also um, recommendations for how to address those issues. At this point, I would like to open it up for Q&A. We already had one question that was in the chat, which I will read out loud, and Dr. Schwenk um, has agreed to take on this question question. It's an excellent question. How do we as providers deal with disparity based on insurance that then affects minority populations, i.e. Medicaid will not pay for a treatment, but other private insurance might? And if anyone has other questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat. Dr. Schwenk. Uh, thanks, Dr. Jacobs. I thank Dr. Strominger uh, for the question. Dr. Strominger is a, a prominent and distinguished academic ophthalmologist in the community, and he asks an excellent question. Um, and I'm gonna just go straight to, to the issue. I think this is a single payer issue, and I'm not uh, afraid to, 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 to dive into this. Physicians as a group are not the most liberal politically uh, in the country, but uh, a majority, actually a substantial majority of physicians favor single payer healthcare, not single delivery system, pluralistic delivery system, single payer healthcare. And the reason is for exactly what Dr. Strominger said, which is physicians are confronted with um, the uh, inability to provide certain types of care to patients that they know would be helpful. And you're never gonna have an equitable health system if you have different sources of payment and different sources of insurance uh, for different groups of patients. And, and, to, and as, a, as a healthcare, practitioner to know that there's something you could do that would contribute to this patient's quality of life. And you are just truly precluded from doing that because of some artificial insurance constraints. It's unbelievably frustrating and, and extremely upsetting. Um, I, I speak to a lot of political groups in the community and some of them fairly conservative. And I, I attack this issue head on and I say, look, this is not a moral issue. I mean, you can make it a moral issue, that's fine, but this is an economic issue that somewhere in the economy, this inequitable health care is taking a toll. So either patients uh, don't have insurance and they come to the emergency room and they end up uh, being hospitalized or being cared for, 
late in a disease when it could have been handled more simply and more um, effectively and, and less expensively earlier on, uh, or the um, um, uh, workman's compensation or the um, inability to work or the attrition from work or the turnover at work or workplace productivity, all of those things may be affected um, by this. Um, I tell uh, employers frequently that uh, they should be uh, really concerned that as employers providing health care and health insurance for their employees that um, that a third of what they uh, pay for is either unnecessary, uh, redundant, duplicative, or truly dangerous. And that should be an issue. And I think we as a society, and especially we as a, as a physician profession, need to hit this head on. Great response, Dr. Schwenk. Would any of the other panelists like to add to that? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Schwenk. We have another question from Dr. West. Are we as a university evaluating our curriculum for areas of medical education that need more racial uh, and historical context? Um, uh, I think that's a great question. I think I get the gist of it. We are actually, we are working with the Medical Education Steering Committee. We're working with all of the diversity kind of affinity groups. We're looking at cases of the week. We're looking at opportunities to um, infuse more knowledge and, and history and background about diversity. We're also looking at spaces where race may be um, not used appropriately or correctly, very much in line, Kelsey, with that article that you put in the chat. I, I read that article, it's fantastic. Um, so we're not, we're not doing it as well as we probably could be, but, but it is very much on our radar screen, um, really because of that article, and we are trying to address that. Did you wanna, was there anything else in your question? No, that answered it great. I uh, just, you know, I went to medical school here and I remember getting a lot of uh, education on things like what um, problems are worse in certain minority communities, but not necessarily much education on things like, you know, the historical context of why a GFR is different for African Americans or, you know, why specifically mm -hmm. we prescribe different anticoagulations and stuff like that. So I think that was answered excellently. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. West. So we have another question here from Sarah Lopez that Dr. Schwenk has also offered to respond to, and I thank him for that. The question is, what recommendations do you have for physicians to not only identify, but also address issues with a patient's social determinants of health that may come up in a patient encounter, especially with the time constraints of the typical office visit? So I'll ask Dr. Schwenk to start, but I'm sure our other panelists may want to weigh in as well. So I published an editorial in JAMA several months ago that uh, addresses this to some extent, and that is the role of the physician with social determinants. And I personally believe that we as physicians are not the best people to address this. We have to appreciate the problem. We have to recognize the problem. We have to acknowledge the problem. We have to be sensitive to the problem. I'm not sure that we are the ones to best do this uh, under the usual constraints of clinical medical practice. This is where teamwork comes in. We have to have a much more robust approach to team-based care that gets people who are really smart about this and really able to, to take care of some of these issues to uh, address them. I mean, my experience over my time in practice is my best friend is a social worker mm -hmm. who's going to address so many of these issues that I myself am not that smart about. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Schwenk. I, I think it is important for physicians to be aware, but I think this is where it, the interprofessional team comes in, as you right. mentioned, right. knowing what the resources are in the community, um, maybe having a behavioral health person, specifically a social worker that, that maybe even works, uh, they're co-located with you in terms of it, having an integrated care model, knowing when to refer, how to refer to other social services. I think that's really important. Um, Dr. Patterson, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure, thank you. So, so I agree with both of you. I think uh, maybe physicians may not be the, the best individuals to actually deal with this. Um, uh, but if, if someone does have uh, social determinants of health um, and it gets past your electronic medical record system and your screening, this is where patient-centered communication, relationship-centered communication is extremely valuable. And in the initial part where you're um, developing rapport and you're getting a list of issues for the patient, you may find that their underlying story is a housing problem and you spend time on that. And then if you have a robust team and a robust uh, referral network, 
you can help them after um, that appointment. But uh, yeah, it's just, I, I think getting the story on the table, finding out what's interfering with the optimal health for that individual, as physicians, we can elicit that. But I agree with the team uh, approach that Dr. Schwenk and, and Dr. Jacobs mentioned. <laughs> That was a great question and some great responses. Thank you. Um, I do realize that we have one minute left. So um, I want to be respectful of time. If anyone needs to leave, um, you're welcome to leave. But if anyone would like to stay on, if our panelists are okay with a few more minutes, we have just a couple more questions here. Um, we, uh, a lot of the medical students have been shocked by the concept of public charge, as was I. Um, in what ways can we expand access to healthcare and set up benefit programs for those um, with free cards so that they do not jeopardize their immigration, sorry, green cards, so that they do not um, jeopardize their immigration status? Uh, Oscar, you spoke about that. Would you like to address this? Yeah, and my technology, Andrew's mustache, that's, that's sharp, man. <laughs> uh, no, uh, it's, it, it's, it's complicated in the sense where you gotta definitely build trust and rapport with, with your community. And, and that comes from not, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen on the first visit. It's gonna be something that's gotta be, be continuously brought up and, and talked about. And that means and a lot of what that happens even with Community Health Alliance is finding friends and families, right? It's, it's word of mouth, it's, it's that long-term trust. And that's where we've all been talking about is how do we build that rapport and that diversity and the understanding of what that community brings. Uh, quite often we talk about just not so much the recruitment, but it's important to recruit within the communities that you want to serve because you've had that trust, you've built that rapport, and they better understand the circumstances that those families are, are going through. Currently, right now, with the public charge, it's important to go out and find people that are trusted in the community right now that can speak to what is public charge. One of the heavy lifts that we're all dealing with is the, the, the fake news that goes through our social media. And a lot of times, we are not quick enough to either correct that news or we share that fake news. And then we as all professionals and all of you as professionals already carry heavy shoulders, but that much more your shoulders are that heavy because we look at you as professionals mm -hmm. to say, whatever Andrew says must be true, right? Whatever Oscar says must be true because he shared it and he liked it and so forth. So we carry that extra responsibility that we ought to be thoughtful about because all of our friends and families are watching us. Um, so be correct on what you share, but also take an opportunity to, to when you have the opportunity to go and grab some coffee in some of those neighborhoods that those residents live in. Be familiar with the communities that they live in. Take a drive through some of those communities uh, because that's only gonna support you when you have those conversations with Oscar and say, hey, you know, Oscar, did you check out that spot? That's great. And then you build that rapport because you're doing, you're going that extra mile when you go home at night and you better understand their circumstances and they better appreciate that and that builds that rapport. And that will break apart some of this public charge conversation and say, you know what, actually, that public charge, when you go get WIC, that's not going to be a hit against your citizenship. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's false. That's, that's a myth. Uh, you deserve some of those resources. You worked hard for those resources. We want you guys to be safe and healthy. And so we're going to make sure that you go to a place that, that you feel trusted in that. So it's, it takes time. Sometimes it's tedious, but the outcomes are, are amazing. But thanks for that. Thanks for that question, Andrew. Thanks for that response, Oscar. And that was a great question, Andrew. I did miss a comment from Dr. Larson. Um, she noted that it's important to recognize that there are um, inequalities for people with HIV and for people with substance use disorders. Um, that's an area that's near and dear to my heart. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, there are so many healthcare disparities and so many inequities that we could have. We could have one of these sessions every day for years and years and years, and we wouldn't get till the end of it. But thank you for bringing that to our attention. So I will have the one last question here from Michelle Horn, uh, who used to work with us, and I'm so glad to have you be part of this conversation. What role should medical schools play to help eliminate healthcare disparities within their communities and within the spectrum of care delivery? That is such a great question. Would any of the panelists like to address that? I'll start with one. So I'm not a medical doctor, so I'll just sort of put that little asterisk by me. Um, but I am a mentor, and I know that students that see that I mentor, um, that they see what I'm doing and they model what I do, if they like me, right? <laughs> or, if, or I can also be a negative mentor. 
And so for those physicians that are modeling the team, um, team treatment, right? So they're going to their social workers, they're going and utilizing other expertise. Students are going to model that. Um, and so, and also whether, you know, what, how they're interacting with patients, students are going to model that. Um, they're going to also model negative behavior. So we have to be very careful. And just because you've been doing it one way forever doesn't mean that you should continue doing it that same way. So be very cognizant about what it is that, that you're doing, what you're showing your students. Thank you, I Dr. Would, oh, go ahead. Um, to second what Dr. Lucero mentioned, I think that modeling and mentorship actually goes a long ways. You know, what they see you produce is often what they are likely to produce. And I think that um, it speaks volumes. So if they see that you actually take into consideration what the patient social determinants, even if it's just for one or two minutes and you recognize something and then move it forward into the right channel, whether it be social work or, you know, something else that can uh, again really add a lot of value to that patient so I think being mindful um, of the amazing responsibility that you do have um, mm -hmm. and ha that trickle-down effect to students and so forth can be very impactful um, for whatever organization you're with um, and so forth. Thank you Dr. Curry Winchell and and I would add Michelle I could speak to this forever as you probably know um, all of the things that are under recommendations um, I think medical schools have, um, they need to have a central role. And in fact, it is an obligation because we're the ones that are teaching the future physicians. I think PA programs, nursing programs, social work programs, all healthcare profession schools really need to have this central role in terms of increasing the diversity of the workforce. And then once folks are in the workforce to making sure that they are treated well, that they, that they, that they have that an equitable environment where they can thrive. I think we need to change um, how, how the narrative of healthcare, right? So um, the way that we talk about um, differences, genetic, or excuse me, racial differences, we it has anything to do with genetic different or, you know genetic inferiority when we talk about disparities we want to use the opportunity to make sure that our, our learners understand social determinants of health and what were the systemic issues that allowed for those social determinants to play such a significant role um, so so there's all kinds of things that medical schools need to do and I think we play a very very uh, central role with that so I want to just share my screen real quick and finish off here. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in this. Um, if anyone needs continuing medical education credits, please email Jennifer Doherty. She will get you the form and you can return that form to her so that you can get your CMEs. Um, on the right panel, you will see the future uh, diversity healthcare, uh, diversity health series uh, sessions that we have. Um, we have two every semester. The next one is looking at institutional racism in healthcare. Um, and this promises to be a great one looking at some of those historical factors. Um, and then in February, we have Dr. Packham talking about uh, racial wealth and the, uh, the divide in terms of um, health in Nevada. And then we will wrap up with a talk um, out of our OBGYN department looking at racial disparities along the reproductive uh, continuum. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for participating. In particular, I'd like to thank our panelists. Um, you guys did a great job of highlighting what some of these issues are and, and um, answering the great questions that our participants uh, posed. Uh, like I said, hopefully this will be the first of many um, and hopefully we can continue to come together um, as a community um, to address these healthcare disparities and to try to mitigate them as much as possible. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening um, and thank you again.